بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم مبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ختم الأنبياء وإمام المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه إلى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا بفيد فضلك رشدنا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله in our lessons on the essentials of Islamic beliefs we began by looking at the introduction to the author and the text and this text that we are covering is a metan, is a primer. It's in poetry form by a great Hanafi jurist and theologian, Imam Siraj al-Din al-Ushi. And for over 700 years, it's been one of the great teaching texts of Islamic theology. So we looked at that, and we looked at the author's opening in which he began by praising Allah, sending blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then talking about who Allah is. And today, bi ta'ala, we're going to look at Allah Most High's at attributes. So we touched a little bit on this notion that in studying Islamic beliefs, broadly, you might have two key aims. You may want to just learn the core of your beliefs yourself. And as the author of another text that we also cover here at Seekers, he says, تَكْفِيكَ عِلْمًا إِن تُرِدْ أَن تَكْتَفِي لِأَنَّهَا بِزُبْدَةِ الْفَنِّ تَفِي It is sufficient as knowledge if all you seek is sufficiency because it contains the core of this science. But for the student of knowledge, someone who wants to deepen their knowledge of the subject, it serves as a key step in a graduated journey of foundational knowledge and then widening one's understanding and then going to the depths and towards mastery of the science of Islamic theology. So we mentioned and discussed a, a classic four-step curriculum for a uh, student of knowledge. And we saw that in the previous lesson, if you weren't able to catch it. There's also, of course, a reality of the fruits of faith. Faith has been described in the Qur'an as being a seed planted in the heart, and it is meant to bear fruit. And this is the metaphor from Surat, Surat Ibrahim, verse 24. And this tree bears fruit in every season by leave of its Lord. Last lesson, we looked at divine oneness, who Allah himself is, and we highlighted the importance of reflecting on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These serves as proofs for the one who does not yet have belief, but these proofs for us are signs and points of reflection. Signs and points of reflection. So when we look at creation, we consider, so we realize that this is this is created. It is from the creating of Allah. Hada khalqullah. And from that we see it being created, it being changing, it being in need of the one who gives it the gift of life, the one who sustains it. So from that we saw that the classical understanding of God, the one worthy of worship, is because God is the one free of all need, whom all are in absolute need of. And the author chose certain key attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring in highlight. And these are the attributes of Allah being living and existent and having will and power. And this he did so in a very logical manner. Why? Because we, because if you say God exists, but 
God has attributes. God has attributes. One who has attributes has the quality of life, of hayat. And this is how Allah describes himself. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. Allah, there is no God but him. He is the living and the sustaining from ayat al-kursi. And then if the starting point for most people in acknowledging the creator, in acknowledging God, is the reality that this world is created and everything created requires a creator, then we recognize rationally and revelation tells us from the divine that the one who creates chooses to create and they have the ability to create. So that's why he talked about the two attributes of will and power. So today we continue from there by looking at some of the key attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in lines three to eight, bi'idhnihi subhanahu. In the first part then of today's lesson, we will touch upon how do we understand the attributes of Allah? How do we understand the attributes of Allah? Central to this is a simple reality. And that reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal beyond time. So anything that we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is necessarily eternal and without limit. Right? Anything we affirm for Allah is eternal and without limit. And the eternity of God arises from the reality that he is the necessary existent. He necessarily exists. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolute beyond limit. So any quality that Allah has is absolute and beyond limit. While any quality that created things have is dependent and is limited. Is dependent and is limited. So that's very important to affirm. So when we talk about Allah, it's very important, right? That when we that Allah is absolutely distinct from created things. That's the reality of when we say Subhanallah, how glorious is my Lord beyond all limits. How glorious is my Lord beyond all limits. How glorious is Allah beyond all limits. So no point of comparison arises between Allah and his creation. So he tells us, rahimahullah ta'ala in line number three, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Imam al-Ushi says, huwa al-hayyu al-mudabbiru kulla amrin, huwa al-haqq al-muqaddiru dhu al-jalali. He is the living, the executor of all matters. He is the real, the powerful, the Lord of majesty. He is the real, the powerful, the Lord of all majesty. And in this, there are a few key things. And we touched upon this line briefly in the previous, in the previous lesson. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being living, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being living affirms that he is character, he has the, how do you talk about life when it comes to God? This is one of the things that perplexed the people who thought about God throughout human civilizations. How can you 
is God alive, right? And how do you explain the attribute of life when you ascribe it to God? Because life, they said, what is life in created things? What is life in created things? Some people said life refers to the capacity for pain. Like what's the difference between a stone and an animal? You hit a stone, you can't see. So they had all kinds of, they had other notions of life. But ultimately, and we affirm life, of course, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms it in the Quran, right? in many a verse, ayat al-kursi, but elsewhere as well in the Quran. So they said that life is a quality that something has that is a condition for it to be characterized by other attributes by other affirmative or active attributes. Someone who has knowledge, who has will, who has power, is necessarily characterized by the quality of having life. So that's how they describe life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs none for his life. Why? Because Allah's life is independent. Right? Allah's life is independent. And he is the giver of life to all else that is alive. Because he is the one who brings it in, who creates it, who brings it into existence. And it is he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who then sustains it. And who gives it, who gives living things that capacity that is, that is called life. So he is the bequeather, he is the grantor, subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the gift of life. So that's how they described life. There are, of course, in these matters, lots of discussions. How exactly do we understand life, etc.? But we affirm it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed it. And rationally, one who is characterized by knowledge, will, power, and the, all the other attributes necessarily would be characterized as being alive. But this also has an implication, which is that we believe, and of course, as Muslims, we don't talk about God in this way, and we have to be careful not to use other people's frames of references, but there's this idea of, um, is God an active God? Because there are some Philosophers and some others of religion who were confused, they would say, well, God is the first cause. God set the ball rolling. But then things happen as they might happen. Whereas we affirm with certitude that Allah right, is, and this is not a term, we, we is an active God. He's an active God. And this is pointed to in the second quality, which is Al-Mudabbiru Kulla Amri. He is the executor of all matters. He is the executor, as the author says, of all matters. Right? That everything is willed in eternity, and everything that happens is the active power of Allah, right? the khalq of Allah taking place. هذا خلق الله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. So everything, right? So he is so he is an active God in that sense. والله خلقكم وما تعملون And Allah has created you and all that you do. Everything happens by this active power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he highlights this because of this reason. Right? The one who executes all matters. 
There is nothing that is outside the will and power of Allah. Whether it be the things that happen around us, the things that happen around us, they were willed by Allah in eternity. And it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is bringing them into existence with his power. That's the qada in qadr. And we'll be looking at that a little further. So everything around us happens by the will and power of Allah. But kulla amri includes our actions. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the Quran? وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ and you do not will except if Allah wills. Right? So we have our will and it's undeniable. If I were to take my pale looking tea and pour it on myself, no one would doubt the fact that I chose it. I will not do it because I'm going to drink it. But our choices which take place in the context of time and space, return to the eternal choice, the mashia, the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jalali. He is the real, the real in his existence, and he is the one who affirms all truth. Al Muqaddiru, again, he emphasizes. It is this reality, Al-Muqaddiru, the one who decrees things, who specifies the extents of all things and then brings them into existence accordingly. The truly powerful and the Lord of majesty and the Lord of majesty. So we affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the attributes of majesty and perfection. What Allah has described himself by in the Quran, what our beloved Prophet وسلم, has described his Lord by in the hadith. And what the ummah has agreed that Allah is described by. Because there are expressions that have come from the sahaba and the tabi'een that are and that they concurred on with respect to Allah. And those are in the great ulama of Islam affirm that the things that the ulama agreed that Allah can be described by the ijma it's a source of affirming because ijma what the umma the imams of the umma concur upon which are more than what the, the, that are a limited range of things those necessarily have a basis in the Quran or sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he also points to a reality right in the opening of the text that Allah Most High is known through knowing his names and attributes. Lillahi al-asma'ul husna fad'uhu biha. Allah's are the most beautiful of names, so call upon him by them. So that's line number three. If we look here at line number four, he says, Muridu al-khayri wa sharri. وَالشَّرِّ الْقَبِيحِ لَكِنْ لَيْسَ يَرْضَى بِالْمُحَالِ So he says, he wills both good and bad, right? and the vile. However, he is not pleased with the wrong. He wills both good and bad. Why? Because he wills everything. He wills everything. He is رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ right? He is the Rabb. He is the creator the sustainer, the specifier, the nurturer, the carer of all that exists. That exists. So all that exists includes the good and the bad. As the Prophet وسلم, in one of his du'as of istiftah, of opening the prayer says, وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ Evil cannot be as as ascribed to you. Why? Because it's Allah... It's Allah's creation. He can do what he so wills. If you had a piece of paper, you scribbled on it, you could have used the back of it, etc. But you fold it, you throw it into recycling. It's yours. You could do anything. 
Now, we are custodians. Right? Our ownership is one of amana. Allah is the one who's granted it to us. So we have a, an amana, a trust, not to be wasteful, not to squander, not to be, and wasting and squandering is from lack of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah is the absolute Lord, owner, master. So he creates it, but it's not ascribed to him. The act of God is not evil. Evil relates ultimately to the actions of those morally responsible. The other things that are disliked to us, whether done by people or natural phenomena, those we understand them to be ibtila, tests from Allah. And the Creator has told us that one of the wisdoms of creation is al ibtila, is to be tested. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم. Allah describes Himself, Subhanahu wa Taala, in Surah Al Mulk, which not accidentally we've been encouraged by our Prophet Sallallahu Taala Alaihi Wasallam to recite each night before going to sleep. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم. He is the one who's created death and life. And it's very intriguing why why it would be described the one who has created death and life because the more intuitive way of describing it would be the one who has created life and death. But to highlight the reality of ibtila, of their being, test. What is more testing, death or life? It's death. So it's put first. And there's other Rhetorical reasons why it's put in this way. It also points to a reality of aqidah that we believe that death is not non existence. What is death? Right? Death is not non life. Because does the human die when they die? Only relatively, death is a transition from the life of this world to the life of the barzakh, the interworld, the life of the grave. Right? The soul has stages in its journey. We begin in the life before this life. That's the first life. And many things happen to us before we are alive. We took co a covenant with God. Allah asks us, Alastu bi rabbikum. And we replied, Bella, indeed you are. Then we are placed in the wombs of our mothers. Then we came out into this world. May Allah protect us here. Then we go into the life of the, the grave, the life of the interworld, the barzakh. Then there is the fourth life, which is the resurrection and the events of the resurrection. And the fifth life, or the fifth journey in the stages of the human soul is heaven or hell. So we're just on a journey. So those tests that happen are uh, the displeasing things that other people do. That, are, that surround us, that befall us, that we don't have a choice in. Someone got cancer. Someone walked in, you know, Jack was thinking of Jill and he tripped down the hill. And now he's got a bad back, can't go to work. It's ibtila. Is it good or is it bad? Well, it may be pleasing or displeasing to you, the good or bad in what happens to you or others do to you or that surrounds you, it's good or bad in accordance with how you respond to it. Right? 
if you respond imanan wa if you respond with faith and seeking the reward and good pleasure of Allah, it is pure good for you. And if the best of blessings, you respond to them with ingratitude, with wrongdoing, with sin, that ibtila was bad for you. So he highlights that right from the beginning. And this tells us about the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is good and bad, right? That good and bad ultimately relate to our choices. Now there's things that, yes, we find some things pleasing, displeasing. That's another matter. And Allah's good pleasure. And so some people ask, well, is Allah pleased with oppression? So we have to understand there's a, Allah creates all things. His pleasure, his rida relates to his pleasure is connected with his command. His command. So Allah in Allah Ya'muru bil Adli wal Ihsan. Allah has commanded all that is just and all that is good. And Allah forbids ludity, wrong, and transgression. So all that is just and good is pleasing to Allah. If we do what is just, we do what is good. Al-adl wal-ihsan. That is pleasing to Allah. So his pleasure revolves around his general or specific commands. And his displeasure with the opposite. Then he tells us a matter that you may think is not important, but it's something that people wondered about when they thought that, okay, if God is eternal, how does God have attributes? What does it mean for God to have attributes? So what we need to know is that we affirm that Allah is one himself and he is one in his attributes and he is one also in his actions. We affirm all of that. So we affirm that Allah has attributes. Why? Firstly, because Revelation tells us. As believers, Revelation tells us. Huwa al-hayy. Huwa al-qadir. Huwa al-khaliq. All Allah tells us about himself. Rabbu al-alameen. Alhamdulillahi, Rabbi al-alameen. He characterizes himself with attributes. So we affirm them. And every attribute that Allah has is eternal, is beyond any limit, because there is no limits in absolute eternity. Okay. He says, Sifatullahi laysat ayna thatin wala ghayran siwahu than fisali. Allah's attributes are not his entity himself, nor are they other than Allah's entity, separated. So an attribute is a meaning that an entity is characterized by. An attribute is a meaning that an entity is characterized by. Now that applies to created things too. So some young boy walked over a little frog Thought it, he squished it, but he didn't. So he says, the frog is alive. So it's alive. It has the me this meaning of life that it's characterized by. This is, in created things, this is our attributes. You say, he's, he's got a strong will because he makes choices and he sticks with them. And so on. 
Hmm. Did you squish a frog? No. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. So, but, so that's attributes in general. Someone may be. But our attributes are limited, are dependent, are. They may come and go. And they're given to change. But the attributes of Allah are meanings affirmed for Allah in eternity. That meaning is not Allah himself, but it's not other than Allah. So if you say Allah has qudra, he has power. Right? Power does not exist without the one. It's, a, it's attributed to, but power isn't Allah. Right? It is an attribute possessed by the entity. That's how we understand. It's a meaning affirmed for the entity. Right? And this is how there's different philosophical quandaries that arise from this. Right? So we would affirm that Allah is powerful because he has an attribute. He, he is qadir. Right? He is powerful qadir because he has the attribute of qudra, the attribute of power. He is knowing, he is alim, because has, he has the attribute of ilm, knowledge, and so on. And the critical implication of this for us is that these attributes are meanings by which we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his greatness. And through them, we can turn to Allah and relate to him. That when we reflect on the knowledge of Allah, knowledge, ilm, is one of the attributes of Allah. We appreciate the greatness of God. Because Allah knows not just what is happening, Allah knows all that is necessary, all that is possible, whether it is or it isn't. And Allah knows all that is absurd. We reflect on the attribute. It tells us about the one who it is attributed to and his greatness, right? his jalal, his beauty, his jamal, his kamal, his perfection, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So likewise, when we reflect on the will of Allah or the power of Allah, or the speech of Allah, the kalamullah, and so on. Okay. And in line six, he tells us, Sifatu dhati wal af'ali turran qadimatun masunatu zawali. Allah's essential attributes and his attributes of action are all eternal beyond ending. So Allah's attributes, Allah exists eternally. And Allah's eternity is a beyond timeness. Eternal doesn't mean that lasting for a long, 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 long time. It's not a continuum of moments. Allah's eternity is a beyond timeness. Time does not relate to Allah. There's an amazing hadith. It's a sahih hadith of the beloved Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam in which our Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam says that Allah Most High says يَسُبُّ بْنُ آدَمَ الدَّهَرْ وَأَنَا الدَّهَرْ أُقَلِّبُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارْ The child of Adam curses time. And I am Time, meaning I am the Lord of time. I am the one who turns night into day. So Allah is the Lord, the creator of time. He is untouched by time. He 
if creation is like a painting, where in the painting is the painter? Of course, لِلَّهِ الْمَثَلِ الْأَعْلَى So Da Vinci made the painting, then he jumped into it. It's absurd. Right? Of course, لِلَّهِ الْمَثَلِ Nothing compares to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but just to comprehend the absurdity of affirming otherwise. So Allah's attributes are eternal. But then a question arose that if Allah's attributes are eternal, what about Allah's actions? Because the actions are manifest in time. So if I take this cup and I take the lid off and I throw the lid, right? That took place in time. Now, who created that action? Who created that action? I threw it. But who created this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this act was created by Allah. But the action takes place in time. So what's the relationship between the action taking place in time and the attribute of Allah? And we know from the attributes of action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rizq. He is al-razaq. There is khalq, creating. There's ihya, giving life. Imata, causing death. So these take place in time. So what does that mean about the attributes of Allah's actions? So when we say Allah is the provider, al-razaq, what about the attribute of provision, providing? Al-razq or al-rizq. And this is something the theologians differed upon. What clearly you affirm, there's three things. There is the act itself that is manifest in creation. It's taking place and it's an attribution to Allah. So the attribution, so according to the theological school that Imam al-Ushi is coming from, the Maturidi school, all the attributes of action are eternal. The attributes of action are what the eternal one, Allah, is described by for the actions that take place in the context of time and space. So the, the their attribution to Allah, so when we at attribute giving life to Allah, and he say he, he is, he has the attribute of ihya, this is the meaning that Allah is characterized by eternally. It is the create, the creating, the giving life itself that is in the context of time and space. So Allah's attributes are eternal and beyond time, and his attributes of action, right, according to Imam al-Ushi and, and this school, is they are also eternal because it is the ascription of the act to Allah. And Allah being eternal, that ascription to Allah would mean that Allah eternally is raziq, khaliq. Muhi, Mumit, right? Allah, so he has eternally this quality of rizq and ihya and imata of providing, giving life, taking life, etc. And if you look in the opening of the Aqiyah Tahawiyah, reasonably early on, he says, right, that هو الرازق ولا مرزوق والخالق ولا مخلوق and he is the provider when there is nothing to provide, he, he was the creator when there is no creation, right? Because its attribution to Allah is an absolute eternity. And upon creating, no, Allah does not gain any meaning, says Imam al-Tahawi, that he did not eternally possess before creating. Because the before and after relates to that which is circumscribed by time and space. Before and after do not relate to
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in the last part of the lesson, we're going to look at the transcendence, the tanzeeh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, this is one of the critical elements of how one knows Allah. That we know Allah بِالنَّفْيِ وَالْإِثْبَاتِ By negation and affirmation. That's how the kalimat al-tawheed, the statement of divine oneness is. La ilaha illallah. Right? There is no God, none worthy of worship, none characterized by any attribute of divinity, none absolutely free of need of any other, except Allah. So all attributes of divinity are Allah's alone. All worthiness of worship is Allah's alone. All ab the absolute freedom of need is Allah's alone. And the implication of that also is that none has any attribute, any share of any attribute of Allah in any way whatsoever. And therefore, none of what is affirmed for Allah can in any way be affirmed for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Revelation, this is very clearly understood because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing whatsoever like unto him. The ulama of tafsir had to think deeply about this verse because it contains a double negation. Laysa ka mithlihi shay. There is a double negation. In a very simplistic reading, a double negation can mean an affirmation. Someone asks you, would you like some tea? So you say, I don't, don't want tea. What does that mean? Well, it could mean you're confused. Or maybe, you know, your wife's told you you're not supposed to have caffeine. And you don't know whether she's in the room or not. So you say, I don't not want tea. Right? Or I don't not want some candy. Because you've got a wobbly tooth and you don't know what your parents will say. But that's not, it's not a, how do you understand the double negative? Laysa ka mithlihi shay. The kaf is for, it negates similitude. Yeah, Laysa, there is nothing like, like him. But it is for emphasis. There is absolutely nothing like unto him in any way whatsoever. This is also the meaning of our tasbih. We say subhanallah. Right? It's Allah is exalted beyond any similitude or comparison or any sharing in his attributes in any way whatsoever or in anyone else sharing any of his attributes in any way whatsoever. This also of the many meanings affirmed when you say Allahu Akbar. Because Allahu Akbar is not a comparative. God is greater. Because who else is great before God? It means Allah is the absolutely great. This is an absolute superlative. Allah is the absolutely great. There is none great besides him. Because what is affirmed for Allah is absolute. Anything affirmed for any besides Allah is contingent, dependent, limited. So there's no point of comparison between the contingent, the dependent, and the limited, and the eternal and absolute. No point of comparison arises between the creator and his creation. But don't we say that so-and-so has knowledge? 
We say so, so and so is a alim, but isn't Allah al alim? There's no point of comparison between someone who has a certain body of knowledge and the one who has eternal, absolute knowledge. Then there in line number seven, one of the things that arises is that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a term several times. Shay, right? A thing. Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of all things. Laysa kamithlihi shay. And this is also really amazing because this is one of the things that the philosophers and people of, and the theologians and metaphysicians of the Greeks and the Persians and the Indians and the Chinese, others, always were one of the things, if you think deeply, what is a thing? What is the quiddity and essence of things? You don't have to worry about those terms. Right? But what's a thing? And we don't need to go into the, into the discussion, but the summary is, that anything that exists can be called a thing. So in another text of Islamic beliefs, Jawharat al-Tawheed says, وَعِنْدَنَا الشَّيْءُ هُوَ الْمَوْجُودُ right, That a thing is that which exists. And this has many implications because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of all Things, meaning of all that exists. But then, can Allah be referred to as a thing? Yes. Now, of course, we don't say that's not a name of Allah, but because in the context of the Quran, also in, in the way certain hadiths have come, you know, the said we can name نُسَمِّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَ شَيْئًا لَا كَالْأَشْيَاءَ وَذَاتًا عَنْ جِهَاتِ السِّتِّ خَالِي It says we can refer to Allah as a thing but not as things and an essence a that exalted beyond the six directions. So a few things here. Right? We talked Give a little context. A thing is anything that exists. Sometimes in the Quran, a thing also refers to that which could exist. It could exist. So there it's not something that already exists, but it is something that could exist. Right? But in the context of the scholarly usage they said yes Allah could be referred to as a thing but that's but we talk about Allah the way Allah talks about himself and right? the way Allah refers to himself the way our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam refers to himself and the ways that the ulama said that Allah can be referred to because you need the utmost reverence is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And he can be referred to as an essence. Because yeah, if you're describing that there is God himself, that's what we mean by that. There's God himself, and then there's what we characterize God by, which is, are his attributes. And then there's what God does, which are his actions. And then there's what God commands, those are his. That's the amr, the command of God. And then he says... Anil jihad is siti khali. Allah is transcendent beyond all six directions. Right? Imam Al Tahawi in his Aqidah, and Imam Al Tahawi died in the early part of the, you know, of the fourth centuries, from the first three centuries of Islam, in his 
Aqiyya Tahawiyya, which as Imam Subki says, is a creedal statement that all of Ahl Sunnah agreed upon. He says that لا تحويه الجهات السِّتْ That the six directions do not encompass Allah. Why? Because directions are something that a direction is a relative relationship between two things that occupy space. Right? So I have my perfume and I have this cap, which my, the cap of my cup which came back. So right now, they're next to each other, but now they just change direction. So a direction is a relative relationship between two objects, right? and there are six. Right? Now this relates to that which takes up space. Space is necessarily created. So Allah is not the six directions do not relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا تحويه الجهة السِّتْ The, you know, the, the scholars of the tradition that Imam Ushi is coming from, the Maturi, these are very clear as Imam Abu Hanifa is clear in his, in the treatises ascribed to him that we affirm what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms in the noble Qur'an. But we also negate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates in the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. The All-Merciful upon the throne is established. So this istiwa, Imam Abu Hanifa is very clear. We affirm what Allah has affirmed. So that affirmation is attribute that by affirming what Allah affirms, we have attributed it to Allah. So it is an attribute in that lexical sense, in the sense of language. Has Allah said it? Yes, Allah has said it. But what does it mean? Because there's words and there are meanings. And language indicates meanings in a myriad of ways. The basis is you understand things literally. But you always understand things literally? No, necessarily, in every language. If you say that India slaughtered Pakistan at the World Cup, does not mean they gathered the whole Pakistani team right? in the middle of the stadium. And they you know, said whatever execution rights Hindu folks might say, although they have a bunch of Muslims on their team too. Okay? So he said different religious chants and they killed them all. No, it's understood. Right? And that's just the nature of language. And you see that throughout the Quran. You see that throughout the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Ask the town. Can you ask a town? Can you ask a town? No. There is something necessarily implicit. And this is called the indication of what is necessarily implicit, which is ask the people of the town. The, if you were to take the verses of wudu literally, what does it say? When you stand to pray, then wash your faces. If you took it literally, it would mean that we stand to pray and it, then we have water ready in front of us and we make wudu where we, when we stand to pray. But as we know, as Ibn Abbas and you know the tafs, what is anybody who understands it, it's understood. This is this is not ijtihad. This is a linguistic understanding. That anyone who hears this understands a whole bunch of things that are unstated. 
if someone says, bring me some tea, and you brought them, if they're just a regular tea drinker, you brought them a tea bag, or if they're a little more sophisticated, you brought them some tea leaves. Said, here you go. And when you say, bring me the tea, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's unstated. Now that's in every language. And that's the, so we affirm what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms, but saying that it is literal is, is necessarily problematic. So we affirm, Allah has described himself with istiwa. Okay, we affirm, what has Allah affirmed? The word, but the literal meaning of it is necessarily absurd for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who has told us, that يعني, then he is established on the throne. That's also told us he is absolutely not like anything. So that istiwa is necessarily absolutely distinct. So it could not be literal because literally it means being on something. So if Allah is et eternal, how could you have an eternal throne? And that would be a partner with Allah. And you'd end up saying things that are beyond reason. Right? Then you'd have to affirm, like certain literalists did, they took the, the, the false position of the, of the philosophers who said that infinite regress is possible. That you could have some, that because they wanted, the philosophers argued that the world is eternal. But how could something that is created and changing be eternal? They said because infinite regress is possible. And that's absurd. We may touch upon that later. We have resources on seekers about the absurdity of infinite regress. We study that further. So, so that's why he is exalted beyond all directions. We affirm what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed. And we also negate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negated. And then, which is any similitude, we neither over affirm by saying it is literal. Where does it say it's literal? Right? The, what Allah has affirmed is a statement. It is words. What does it mean? The literal meaning is problematic. So we consign the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is understood from Surah Al Imran, verse 7, the third surah, verse 7. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, It is He who has sent down to you the book. In it are clear, decisive verses. They are the foundations of the book, they are the basis by which the book is understood. وَأُخَرُوا مُتَشَابِهَاتِ And other verses that are not clear. And then he describes two ways to understand these. فَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْخِ As for the ones in whose hearts is waywardness. What do they do? فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ They seek out the unclear verses. They make those the basis of their interpretation. Why? And Allah subhanahu wa tells us there the psychology of the sectarian. Ibtigha al fitnati wa ibtigha al Seeking strife, fitna. And seeking to understand their ultimate reality. That's ta'wil, is ta'yinul ma'na, is to specify a decisive meaning for something. وَمَا يَعْلَمُوا تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And no one knows its ultimate meaning but Allah. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّ بِهِ As for those firm-footed in knowledge, they say, we believe in it all, both the decisive and the non-decisive verses, the muhkam and the mutashabih. 
كُلُّمْ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا It is all from our Lord. And generally, the, the school that our author, there are two mainstream schools within Islamic theology, the Ash'aris and the Maturis. The Maturis generally affirm and consign. Generally. And they don't give a, they don't specify a possible meaning for the verses, though that is also a tenable way. We'll look at that later. Then he says, وَلَيْسَ, وليس الْإِسْمُ عَيْنَ الْمُسَمَّى لدى أهل البصيرة خير آلي. The name is not other than the one named according to the people of insight, the best of folk. So this is one of the philosophical discussions. It's just a building block to understand it. If you want to get some headaches on a Sunday, you could read in any of the great works on Asma'illah al-Husna, the discussion of the name, the naming, and the named. Because there's the one named, and there's a name, and somehow the name is ascribed to them. Now, what we affirm is that the name is the one named insofar as that it, insofar how is the name the one named insofar as the name points to the one named and to nothing else so if you say ar-rahman right ar-rahman is the name and the name is either a personal name which is allah that points to allah the one possessed of all meanings of perfection exalted beyond all meanings of imperfection but if you say Ar-Rahman or Al-Wadud, Al-Khabir, this name brings into focus a quality that Allah, the one named, possesses, and it points to the one named, Allah. And how is the one eternal have names, ultimately, we don't know. Allah has, Allah tells us in Revelation, لِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna. Allah's are the most beautiful names. So the names that we affirm for Allah, and we only affirm what Allah and His Messenger have affirmed of names and attributes. Okay. What is, how does that naming take place? Because language is created, all these things. We don't know. And even the, mo the latest theologians, someone said, you want tea? No, I just finished two cups of tea. I still have a little bit. Um, so this is the thing that the name is the one named insofar it points to them. What is the significance of this? Right? The implication is one of being present with Allah. Because when we say, for example, Ya Rahman, who are we calling upon? Whichever name you call upon him by, his are the most beautiful names. His are the most beautiful names. The name is pointing to the one named. When you say, for example, when, when we read the Quran, Inna Allah, Rahim. Indeed, Allah is the all-forgiving, the merciful. When we say, Ya Ghafoor, O most forgiving, who is the most forgiving? And we bring, we highlight a meaning that Allah possesses. But it is pointing to Allah. When we say, Ya Latif, and there's a bunch of du'as that mention Allah's divine name, Al Latif. Who is Al Latif? We're not focused just on the quality of lutf, of subtle divine grace and favor. But al-latif is the one who has subtle grace. Point ascribed to him with all his other meanings. When we say Allah is ar-Rahman, 
Are we denying that he is Al Dhul Jalal? That he is the, mo the, the Lord of Majesty? Of course not. We're bringing into focus, as it were, one meaning, but all the other meanings are there. Right? So when we, throughout the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about his names, he is pointing us to himself, highlighting different meanings that he subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses. And that's one of the great wisdoms of Allah throughout the Quran telling us about his names. Because every name points to Allah, but brings into focus some of the at attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses. He is the living. Who is Al Hay? He is. So when you say Al Hay, it's Allah the living. One of the ways we can translate the names, right? Just to or conceive of the names ourselves is to say Allah the living, Allah the merciful, Allah the generous, Allah the provider. So call upon him. Making your devotion. Deen here is making your devotion sincerely for his sake alone. So each of the names that Allah mentions in the Quran that are mentioned in dua, the practical point in this is those names all point to the one named Allah, right? So be present with him when you recite his names, when you recite the Quran or in dua, or when you reflect on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They all point to Allah, right? Because who else? Who else's names are they? Right? Like, you know, if someone goes to Sheikh Saad, right? But so... Brother Saad is sitting without his sheikh clothes. There is Sheikh Saad here. Say so he's not here right now. And you put on your sheikh clothes and they say, now I'm Sheikh Saad. No. Right? The name points to the one named. Practically, it's in these three things. When we recite the Quran and the names of Allah come, we should know the meaning that they highlight, but it is pointing to Allah. Likewise in dua, right? for example, when we say one of the most common duas of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, Bi Rahmatika Astaghith, O living, O all sustaining, it is in your mercy that I beseech urgent aid. Who is Al Hayy? It's like when you say, O Allah the living. O oh Allah, the all-sustaining, it is in your mercy, O oh Allah, that I seek urgent aid. Right? So the, point, the practical point of this discussion is the name is not other than the one named, that when you recite the Quran, when you engage in dua, or when you reflect on these names of Allah, where's the focus is on Allah with the highlighting of a particular quality, but consciousness of all the names and attributes of Allah thereby. Next lesson, we're going to look further at the issue of the transcendence of Allah, the tanzih of Allah, and what is the, what is the Quran, right? As the kalamullah, as the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today, we looked at certain key attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we touched upon this critical quality that what we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is every attribute of perfection. Right? And also highlighting this reality that we affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the key to under to Understanding what Allah tells us about his attributes is that Allah's eternity 
is a beyond is beyond time time is necessarily created just as space is necessarily created allah's existence and his attributes are in no way circumscribed delimited by time and they are they're in no way circumscribed by space so when things are affirmed right and we'll be looking further next lesson at this meaning of transcendence right but this is a, a matter that the theologians took very seriously what does imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi say in, in his Tahawiyah, he says, وَمَنْ أَثْبَتَ لِلَّهِ مَعْنًا مِنْ مَعَنِ الْبَشَرِ فَقَدْ كَفَرْ That whoever affirms any human-like quality to Allah has committed an act befitting only a person of unbelief. doesn't mean that they're kafir. It just means they're confused. Right? And th but this stirring, you know, bringing out the mutashabihat, right, the Verses that are differed upon, that whose meaning is not clear because they could not be literally true. A God that exists in time is not God. A God that it takes up space is not God. Because something that takes up space is in need of the space that it takes up. And if the space is created, how does the eternal enter into space? How does something eternal move around? Because movement is something that takes place in the context of time and in the context of space. And anything that's given to change is necessarily created. This is a Quranic proof. Allah, we talked last lesson about reflecting on the closing verses of Surah Ali Imran, verses 190 to 200. And the two two of the greatest of the rational proofs, the proof of creation and the proof of contingency, of neediness, right? And the proof of creation being in need of a creator arises from change. It's either changing or accepts change. And anything that accepts change is necessarily created. So that's something that we touched upon, we also looked at the reality that given that Allah wills all things, He wills both good and bad. Right? But good and bad do not relate to Allah. Good and bad relate to the choices of those morally responsible. So we touched upon that. And we affirmed that all the attributes of Allah, including the attributes of action, Sifat al Afal, are eternal. For the same underlying reason that Allah is eternal beyond time, so are his attributes. And we also looked at the issue of the naming and the named and the key significance of that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us insight and understanding. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So there's a question that an attribute is a meaning affirmed for the entity. Does this not go against the idea of Allah not being in need of a locus? No, because we, we cannot understand the absolute reality of Allah. Um, in the words of some of the early Muslims, Sometimes it's ascribed to Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, but I haven't seen a, an authentic sanad to him. And the great Maliki jurist, Al-Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi al-Ma'afidi, the great commentator on Sunan al-Tirmidhi and the Muatta, great Maliki jurist. He says this was related by some of the Siddiqeen, some of the great um, righteous uh, people of knowledge. Um, that al-ajzu an al-idraki idrak, recognizing one's incapacity to truly comprehend is comprehension itself. Right? Are 
the greatest of Allah's creation, the beloved messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in his dua, Subhanaka la uhsi thana'an alayk, anta kama athnayta ala nafsik, subhanak, glory be to you. Like how truly exalted you are, that's subhanak. How truly exalted you are. I cannot encompass your praises. Upon you. As you have praised yourself. So we praise Allah. But we realize that's why the, when we recite the Fatiha, we don't say, although it's a dua, we don't say, I praise Allah, the Lord of the worlds. It puts it in a nominal sentence. Alhamdulillahi. All praise is Allah's. Right? And the most emphatic way of conceiving of Alhamdulillah is that it is the lamb is lil ahd. That it is Allah's praise of Himself. It's affirmed for Allah Himself. Because your notion of praising, your conception of praising, and of the one praised, and of his praiseworthiness, all falls far short of what Allah deserves. They have not esteemed God as he deserves to be esteemed. They have not esteemed God as he deserves to be held in esteem. So, the, did Allah need to cre create creation? No, of course not. That, as Imam al tahawi points out in his Aqidah, that, that Allah has all the attributes, including the attributes of action, eternally, perfectly. Because in eternity, there's nothing but absoluteness. So is the world's greatest wrestler, the greatest re wrestler only when they're wrestling? No. Right? And whereas even in a relative sense, is Messi, and of course I have a conflicted relationship with Messi because I'm very much a Real Madrid fan. And I used to use, in the heyday of the Messi-Ronaldo thing, I used to use Messi and Ronaldo as examples and Real Madrid and Barcelona as examples of Iman and Kufr. Because you can... Um, Iman is not simply to know something as true. It's to accept that truth. So there's a period of time when Barcelona were in clear dominance. I don't follow soccer, but I, I'm aware of it because I have so many Spanish friends. I grew up in Spain. Where I knew without doubt that Barcelona is a better team. And there's a few years where Messi was clearly the better of the two. But knowing it and accepting it are two different realities. And that's what kufr is. Is when you deny something as being true. Of course, I explained that in Argentina at a seeker's retreat in rural Argentina. So after the lunch break, they, they got me an Argentina shirt with Messi on it. So I actually put it on under my thobe. So it was visible. I said, and that's nifaq, is when you affirm something, but, but, you know, but that your outward and inward differ. But, um, so Allah has all these attributes perfectly. And that's why some of the scholars use it, that there is the, you know, the, the meaning has a uh, potentiality and an expression. Right? So Allah possesses all these meaning and potentiality. That Allah, so Allah is the provider. He can yarzuku man yasha. He can provide for whomsoever He wills. Bighaydi hisab. Without any measure or reckoning. But whatever He specifically provides is what He chose to provide. Right? Um, but He can also choose not to provide. But His choose it. Were he not to create anything, he would have all his attributes in all their perfection. 
Okay, so we'll continue that from next lesson. بإذن الله تعالى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. There's a question that some of these meanings are heavy. What do we do? They say in general there are three things that are key to learning, which is one is to prepare. So for this course, for example, if you've registered, we have the lesson breakdown, we have the translation of the text, etc. So you can read ahead and reflect. That's the preparation. There are other related readings, and in the in the course we have, for example, there's a beautiful work by a great Andalusian scholar, Ibn Juzay, which has a related verses of the Quran, etc., related to the discussions. You can read the related sections and come having reflected on what we're covering. Number two, in a lesson, the key adab is attentiveness. al isgha All the other adab, right, of avoiding fidgeting, not looking around, they're all facilitative for attention. In Damascus, there's some traders who used to come to the lessons of the Mashaykh. And sometimes they'd sit there and we'd get to know some of them because we're sitting in the Umawi. We're covering some chapter. The Shaykh's having, it's, it's a tough chapter. There's certain chapters in Hanafi fiqh, for example, that is notoriously difficult. Right? Like the chapter on collateral. It's annoyingly difficult. And there's historical reasons for that. This guy sitting there being fully attentive. It's got nothing to do with him. So one of these guys asked him, he said, I find that sitting in lessons helped me have focus in my work. He said, but did you understand what's going on? He said, Wallah, ma he said, Wallah I didn't understand anything. But this is one of the, one of the aspects, to be attentive. Right? And it's one of the greatest skills one can have in a time of distraction. It's just the capacity to focus. Some of the mashayikh, they, they were worried about people having, you know, being distracted by cell phones and this and that. So they took the boot camp approach. They would run classes for like four hours continually and just have a brief pause. Why? He said, we want to break, he said, one of the things, I want to break the idol of inattentiveness. Right? So it's like boot camp. Now we're, we're not doing boot camp, but that's just one of the important things, right? That be ability to focus in the class and then to review, to review. A skill anyone should learn is taking notes. And then you either review your notes or some critical things. They may be benefit also in listening to it more than once. They can be benefit in listening to certain things more than once. And that's, that's a common thing. It's, we're in an age of rushing things, but you know, when we're in Damascus, my wife finished a certain level of Arabic at the University of Damascus, and she told one of our teachers, who's a mentor to us, what you know, that she's going to do the next level. He said, "No, do this level again." And even though she got a good grade, she got an 80, whatever, said, no, just get to 100. It's not a rush, like. You build on solid ground. Right? We're not a civilization of, of disposables. Right? In Damascus, you know, in the old marketplace, there's a series of masajid. The newest of the old mosques is called, it's called Al Masjid Al Jadid or Al Jami' Al Jadid was built in the year 710. It's been standing for the last 730 years. There's a group I know that's looking at buying a church. Here in Toronto, it's 60 years old. And it's a heritage site. <laughs> and its foundations are affected by moisture and the walls have issues and the, you know, because it's a different value. Right? We believe Asluha Thabit, its foundation is strong, and thus its branches are in the heavens. Right? So Anything worth learning is worth retaining. And that's where, after the class, we review. And the mashayikh, one of my teachers, Sheikh Mu'min al-Annan, 
Once I visited him in Damascus, and he'd already completed, he had his ijaza ilmiya. He was already a certified alim. He'd been studying for a dozen years in Damascus. He had all these books out in his room, and very well arranged. So I said, what are you doing, Sayyidi? He said, every six months, I have a comprehensive review of everything I've studied, read, and taught for the last six months. So you take a week every six months and review everything because your knowledge is what you know. If this is not tourism, that, I, oh, I went there too, and yeah, I saw that, and this, and this. Okay, that's tourism. Knowledge is retention. Is retention. Right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to be people of knowledge. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad. Inshallah, we'll be starting the, the class on perfecting prayer in 10 minutes. Um, so for those of you who are following online.